Dr. Wang, would you like to proceed with case number two, BRAF mutated metastatic melanoma? Yes. So here we have a 52-year-old woman who presented to her dermatologist for removal of a pigmented lesion that had been present for some time, but recently she had noticed that it uh, had been changing color, become darker, and maybe started to ulcerate. Pathology from the um, resection revealed a melanoma with a Breslow depth of 1.2 millimeters. It was ulcerated with a mitotic rate of 4 per, mil uh, per millimeter squared. So obviously we have some concerning uh, features of this primary tumor. Uh, Dr. Emmerich, what, from your perspective, are the next steps in the management of this patient? Yeah, we want to think about two things. One is removing that primary tumor. And based on this depth, we'd aim for a one to two centimeter margin around that primary tumor. But also based on these features, intermediate thickness, ulceration, mitoses, it's a, roughly a 20, maybe as high as a 25% risk of occult regional metastasis. And so I think the next step for this patient is a wide local excision and a sentinel lymph node biopsy. Okay. And, uh, you know, interesting data, uh, practice changing data came out from the MSLT2 study and uh, uh, would appreciate your take on the role of lymph node dissection in this era. Yeah, MSLT1 was an important study at showing us the importance of sentinel lymph node biopsy. Um, in terms of a predictor of uh, you know, prognosis, but as we moved into the immunotherapy and targeted therapy realm, it also uh, helped us identify people might benefit from systemic therapy. The follow-up to that being MSLT2, where we said, boy, if you have a positive sentinel lymph node biopsy, do you need any more surgery? Because prior to that study, the standard was if you had a positive sentinel lymph node biopsy, we recommended completion lymphadenectomy. That study said, you know what, it may not be that helpful. And as they looked at two populations, those that went on to have completion lymphadenectomy versus those that were, complete, uh, that were closely watched, we did not see a difference in the survival of those two groups. And so I think many groups around the country, I know our group, we now do not perform completion lymphadenectomy in the setting of a positive sentinel node. Understood. And uh, so, uh, in terms of the risk of recurrence uh, for this patient, what are the key features uh, that you would consider? I think the, the guidance, guidance from that primary tumor, the presence of ulceration in particular, says this patient's at a high risk of recurrence. That could be local slash regional within transit metastasis, but that ulceration says that this patient's also at risk for distant metastasis. That sentinel lymph node biopsy also gives us really important guidance on the risk of recurrence. We know from that MSLT2 that that patient with a positive sentinel node that is watched, there's somewhere between an 11 and 18% risk of having a positive non-sentinel node that could show up sometime in the next two to five years. But that positive sentinel node also predicts a much higher risk of recurrence in the distant setting. And it's interesting, uh, would be, uh, as we see the emerging data in terms of the risk of non-sentinel lymph node, you know, recurring in the, uh, in the presence of systemic therapy. These patients now getting effective adjuvant therapy, and, uh, uh, you know, some groups are, are starting to report data where the risk appears to be lower now. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but th that kind of moves us to the AJCC staging system. Obviously, all these are, are uh, part of the staging of these patients, Dr. Wong. Uh, have you started using the eighth edition in your practice? Yeah. Definitely, and um, I think one of the key things is that the update from AJCC 7 to 8 really helps us to better define prognosis for these patients. Um, for example, in the metastatic setting, um, AJCC 8th edition now includes subdivisions M1, uh, M, uh, state, subdivisions A through D, where uh, M, M stage, but uh, with a subdivision of D, portends CNS metastases, which overall has a f uh, far poorer prognosis than those with a subcutaneous or skin-only metastatic disease. I agree. I think the changes in the eighth edition really better defines the prognosis of our patients and, and dividing them into smaller subgroups. And one would expect in the future, as we're doing the genomic testing and uh, uh, tumor profiling, uh, that we will be even, uh, let's say, more accurate in, in predicting the prognosis. Um, would you like to continue the case? What happened to this patient? Sure. So this patient did undergo a sentinel lymph node evaluation, and her sentinel lymph node was positive. 
Um, this prompted a systemic uh, evaluation with imaging, and a CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis was performed, which showed multiple lesions in both lungs, with, with the largest being 10 millimeters in size. She underwent a core needle biopsy of the largest lung lesion, and pathology revealed metastatic melanoma. Um, she underwent mutational testing by IHC, which confirmed, uh, which was confirmed by next generation sequencing. The melanoma did have a BRAF B600E mutation. Uh, Dr. McCain, uh, what factors would you consider in deciding on the systemic therapy for this patient? Uh, again, this is a patient with metastatic melanoma uh, that has been shown to be uh, BRAF mutant. Uh, the mutation is BRAF V600E. Mm -hmm. I mean, first of all, it's exciting uh, to be talking about metastatic melanoma systemic therapy options um, that we didn't have a number of years ago. So I think the two different approaches to consider for a patient with a newly diagnosed metastatic melanoma in the setting of a, of a BRAF V600E mutation would either be combination targeted therapy or considering combination immune therapy um, for a patient that would be able to tolerate. So I think the factors that would go into consideration, so one, for a patient that has diagnosed metastatic melanoma, I'd make sure to do a brain MRI to see if there's a presence of any uh, CNS metastases. Mm -hmm. I think in the presence of brain metastases, although the data for both targeted therapy and immune checkpoint inhibitors showed similar intracranial uh, disease response, I think we're seeing more durability with immune checkpoint inhibitor. Mm -hmm. So I might be more interested in immune checkpoint inhibitor for that type of patient. Um, otherwise, I think uh, outside of a CNS metastases, I think the considerations are the other patient's other comorbidities. Mm -hmm. Do they have any autoimmune conditions? Mm -hmm. um, the, the timing of response, uh, if this is a patient that's very symptomatic from their disease, even though we can see some um, quick responses with immune checkpoint inhibitor, I think we tend to use targeted therapy because we know it tends to be a faster response. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I think sometimes discussing the, the differences in side effects for patients and the, um, with immune checkpoint inhibitors, some, some of these side effects can be chronic um, long-term side effects that we have to manage versus oftentimes with targeted therapy, they can be kind of shorter uh, side effects with fever or rash that we can stop pills, restart uh, and manage that way. I think just having that discussion with patients about the differences between those two therapies is important.